Welcome to tonight's program, 1970s Lesbian Activism and Community, which will feature Emily Kahn in conversation with Carla J and Ellen Brady. I'm Amanda Davis, the project manager of the NYC LGBT Historic Sites Project. This program is part of a three-part series uh, from progressive reformers to lesbian gathering spots, explorations of same-sex relationships and spaces in New York City. And we wanna thank Humanities New York for sponsoring these three programs through a grant so that we're able to bring these to you to finish off the year. Uh, in addition to tonight's program, we have on November 18th, 20th Century Lesbian Life in Greenwich Village, and on December 13th, Progressive Reformers and Lesbian Lives. And other um, upcoming programs include this Saturday's Gay Greenwood Trolley Tour in, uh, done in partnership with Greenwood Cemetery, and also next Tuesday, October 19th, in partnership with the Lower East Side Preservation Initiative, we'll be looking at the LGBT history of the Lower East Side. So if any of these other programs interest you, please visit our events page at nyclgbtsites.org, or we also have the event right listings. So before we get into our uh, topic tonight, I just wanted to provide you with an overview of our project if you're not familiar with us. I know many of you are. Um, but this is our homepage map. We now have over 370 historic sites associated with LGBT history throughout the five boroughs of New York City. And um, we're always adding more. And these uh, site types you see with eight pins on the right um, are our way of dividing up this history to show its diversity, to get people thinking about spaces uh, in which LGBT people have made an impact on New York City and American culture. I just want to give you a sampling of sites that you're not going to hear about tonight, but are on our website. And because of the theme, I um, focused it in on lesbian activism and community. So uh, bars are obviously an important part of uh, activism and community, uh, particularly in the pre-Stonewall era. Um, and the Sea Colony was a 1950s and 60s lesbian bar in Greenwich Village. Uh, the drawing on the right was uh, drawn by Gwendolyn Siegel, who is a project consultant of ours and also put together a Lesbian Bars presentation that's now on our YouTube page, if you'd like to take a look at that. Another example of, of bar spaces is the Boom Boom Bar in Woodside, Queens, which uh, catered to a predominantly Latina lesbian crowd and was open from the early 90s until a few years ago, uh, which and was one of the last um, four remaining lesbian bars in New York City. Residences we also have, such as the one um, lived in by Ernestine Eckstein, who uh, in the East Village, who was an important pre-Stonewall um, gay rights activist and uh, an important member of the Daughters of Belitis, uh, the first lesbian organization founded in the United States. And we also document other histories in the, bu in the buildings that we look at, and this happened to be a later residence uh, associated with Allen Ginsberg. Uh, the Daughters of Belitis also had an uh, office space that they shared in the 50s, late 50s and 60s with the Manishing Society, another pre-Stonewall group, predominantly male. Uh, and two of, the, two of the most important figures uh, associated with the Daughters of Belitis and with LGBT activism as a whole uh, are pictured here, Barbara Giddings and Kay Lehusen, who used this space as well. And another example is the Lesbian History Archives, which was founded in the early 70s in the Upper West Side apartment of Joe Nessel, which is the photo you see on the right, um, before moving to its current location, which is what you see on the left, in the early 1990s in Park Slope, Brooklyn. So, you know, we have all these pins, 370, as I mentioned earlier. So we also created curated themes to help you navigate the site and the kinds of uh, categories that we've developed to show the wonderful diversity of the community. Um, and going back to the 17th century up to the year 2000, we have 30 in total, and this is just a sampling. So we invite you to go to our theme page to uh, find out more. And then beyond the website and programs like this, we're also actively uh, listing or uh, looking for recog official recognition of LGBT sites on the National Register of Historic Places, which is the federal government's uh, honorary list of sites that have been deemed significant to American history and it's run by the National Park Service. These are the sites that we have successfully nominated since the project began. And this includes Stonewall before our project, but two of our co-directors worked on that nomination. 
And um, the Women's Liberation Center on the lower right is one that uh, tonight's presenter, Emily Khan, have worked on for us this spring. And actually, a number of these are also locally designated landmarks uh, by the Landmarks Preservation Commission, who we um, also have met with and advocated for official protections at the city level. So we're really trying to work to make LGBT history more visible in many different ways. And um, finally, if you're interested in walking tour maps, we have this one that we've uh, worked on with the National Parks Conservation Association and is available on our website, on our resources page. If you have questions and you'd like to find it, feel free to ask um, and we'll help you look for it. It centers around Stonewall and Christopher Park, but also provides other sites in the neighborhood to give you a broader context of LGBT rights and community in the post, in the pre and post Stonewall era. Um, and one last thing, we uh, hope you check out our website, of course, but also follow us on social media if you're not already at NYC LGBT sites on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We're very active on those uh, platforms. And so without further ado, I want to uh, introduce tonight's speaker, Emily Kahn. Emily received her master's in historic preservation from Columbia University in April, 2021. She served as a project consultant for our project from June 2020 to August 2021, helping craft the 1970s lesbian community and activism theme, which you can find on our website, and uh, writing a successful National Register nomination for the Women's Liberation Center, which I just mentioned. She currently works as the program coordinator of the National Fund for Sacred Places at the National Trust for Historic Preservation, and we're Thrilled that she's able to join us tonight and share her research from the past year. So I will hand the screen over to Emily. Well, good evening and thank you to Amanda and Ken for inviting me to speak today. Tonight we will be discussing 1970s lesbian activism and community and how lesbians forged their own spaces in New York City in order to demand recognition within the gay liberation movements and women's liberation movement champion equal rights and amplify their collective voice. And the cartoon that you can see on the title slide depicts lesbian feminist liberation zap on the American Museum of Natural History, which I'll discuss later. And it comically shows how lesbians were empowered through shaping their own actions and sites, and oftentimes in creative ways such as a lavender dinosaur. This presentation is a celebration of our curated theme on 1970s lesbian activism and community. This theme developed over the past year to better illuminate the vast contributions of women within New York City's LGBT history. Queer women wanted recognition for their contributions in the 1970s, and they still want and deserve this recognition today as LGBT history remains a male dominated story. Currently, this theme has 17 sites in three boroughs, many of which were identified by women who shaped and utilized these spaces. And some of these women are here today, so I give them a special welcome. And as always, we would love to hear your recommendations about what other sites we could add to expand this theme. In many ways, the 1970s lesbian activism and community curated theme builds off of the existing lesbian life before Stonewall theme, which I encourage you to explore as well on the website. The majority of the pre-Stonewall women's sites represent residences where women often met and gathered in secret. By the 1950s, when the homophile movement began, lesbians joined in the more public fight for equal rights for all people, regardless of sex or sexuality, through the formation of Daughters of Belitis in 1955. Bars and saloons became a significant part of lesbian activism and communities starting in the early 1900s. Lesbians gathered at bars that catered to a mixed clientele, including Tony Pastor's Downtown, which opened in 1939 in Greenwich Village. And lesbian bars began to develop as early as the 1930s, becoming some of the first public locations for women to gather, in theory, away from men. And some of you may have been at Gwendolyn Stiegel's excellent presentation on lesbian bars in June 2020. And as Amanda mentioned, you can find this on the YouTube page. Many women, however, began looking for alternatives to lesbian bars. These bars faced frequent raids by police as well as unwanted men. 
and were oftentimes mafia operated. I do not want to negate the role that bars such as Cookies in Greenwich Village played in 1970s activism and community, yet they no longer maintained a monopoly on lesbian gathering, as this presentation will show. Alternative spaces to bars for the lesbian community, as well as the LGBT community at large, developed in the immediate wake of the 1969 uprising at the Stonewall Inn, which marked a turning point for the fight for LGBT equality. This uprising sparked the next major phase of the gay liberation movement, which involved more radical political action and led to the creation of new groups such as the Gay Liberation Front, Gay Activist Alliance, Radical Lesbians, and Street Transvestite Action Revolutionaries, or STAR. Queer women participated in heavily male-dominated organizations such as GLF and GAA, using their spaces for events and activism. GAA was approximately 90% male in 1970. GLF and GAA held women-only dances at the GAA Firehouse in Soho, the Gay Community Center in Greenwich Village, and at the Church of the Holy Apostles and Alternate U in Chelsea. But this was not enough. Men continued to invade women-only events and meetings and retain control over the spaces and conversations. Lesbians were in need of their own permanent spaces where they could advocate for their own needs. By 1970, lesbians began claiming spaces across the city, increasing the visibility, autonomy, and reach of the lesbian liberation movement. Our curated theme highlights the diversity of these spaces, which ranged from residences to lesbian-owned businesses to major institutions. And the remainder of this presentation will focus on four major typologies represented in this theme, which are sites of actions, centers, bookstores, and restaurants or cafes. The Lavender Menace at the Second Congress to Unite Women, held in a school in Chelsea, was an early and critical action that marked the desire for lesbians to gain recognition for their contributions to the general women's liberation movement. Radical lesbians with women from GLF and several other feminist organizations staged this action in protest to the National Organization of Women's, NOW's, treatments of lesbians. Now President Betty Friedan referred to lesbians as a lavender menace, fearing that they would tarnish the reputation of NOW if members were accused of being, and I quote, man haters or a bunch of dykes. In March 1970, Susan Brown Miller, another prominent feminist, dismissed, dismissed lesbians as inconsequential to the movement by calling them a lavender herring. After Brown Miller's remarks, Michaela Griffo attended GLS first lesbian dance in a shirt that read, I am a lavender herring. Inspired by Griffo's shirt, lesbian gathered in Ellen Brody's apartment and Rita Mae Brown's recently vacated apartment at 338 East 6th Street to strategize their action and create t-shirts that said Lavender Menace. And one of the actual shirts worn at the action is shown on the screen. On May 1st, 1970, 17 lesbians in Lavender Menace shirts stormed the opening session of NOW's Second Congress to Unite Women. They yelled phrases such as, we are all lesbians, with Carla J, one of our panelists, proclaiming, yes, yes, sisters, I'm tired of being in the closet because of the women's movement. The menaces, as they were called, then successfully demanded that now abandon their schedule to focus on issues of lesbianism. The Lavender Menace action gave lesbians increased control, power, and visibility in the women's liberation movement. Knowing that, quote, the Lavender Menace will strike again anywhere, anytime, any place, now passed the resolution in 1971 acknowledging the double oppression of lesbians as women and as homosexuals and recognizing the oppression of lesbians as a legitimate concern of feminism. The Lavender Menace directly contributed to the development of the Women's Liberation Center, the first permanent advocacy space for the women's and lesbians organizations in New York City, and one of the earliest women's centers in the country. Founded in 1970 and relocated to a former firehouse at 243 West 20th Street in 1972, 
The WLC served as a meeting house and a clearing house for grassroots radical organizations associated with the women's and the lesbian liberation movements. Notably, the NYC LGBT Historic Sites Project led the charge to designate this site as a New York City landmark in 2019 and listed on the National Register of Historic Places earlier this year. And I thank the project for allowing me to be involved with this listing. Due to the ability of women of all backgrounds to gather and share ideas in this space, the WLC helped foster an increased acceptance of lesbians within the women's liberation movement. The WLC further cultivated lesbian activism, both within and separate from the general gay liberation movement, which also often overlooked lesbian issues. Two prominent lesbian organizations developed here, the Lesbian Switchboard and Lesbian Feminist Liberation. Founded in 1972 at the WLC, the Lesbian Switchboard was a volunteer staffed telephone service based at the center that gave peer counseling, referrals, and information about local events and groups to lesbians. It served as a mental health support system, spread awareness about lesbian culture, and overall fostered a sense of camaraderie among women. Co-founded as GAA's Lesbian Liberation Committee in 1972, Lesbian Feminist Liberation became a lesbian rights organization entirely independent from GAA and moved to the second floor of the Women's Liberation Center in 1973. At the WLC, this organization held cultural, social, and political events and campaigned for increased public awareness about the discrimination and legal injustices that lesbians encountered in their everyday lives. One of lesbian feminist liberation's most prominent actions was their zap on the American Museum of Natural History in August 1973. And this is what the comic on the title slide was referring to. This 200 person rally coordinated mainly in private residences and at the WLC protested the sexist, racist and anti-feminist nature of exhibits as well as the overall lack of feminist anthropologists on staff beyond Margaret Mead. To garner heightened attention for the zap, five women spent 10 days building a 200 plus pound 15 foot long lavender dinosaur named Dinah the Dicosaur or Saphosaura out of plaster and other arts and crafts materials. This action illuminates how the Women's Liberation Center forged a culture of radicalized feminism that prioritized lesbian rights. There were many smaller gathering spaces for feminists and lesbians across the city, mainly in the form of bookstores and cafes. Open from 1975 to the mid 1980s, Woman Books was the second feminist bookstore in New York City, after Labyrinth, where the future is female phrase was coined. And Labyrinth is also part of the curated theme and you can read an entry on that there. Karen London, the co-owner of Woman Books, called her store a women's center disguised as a bookstore and the place to meet, chat, connect, find out about resources, find refuge and comfort. The store carried over 6,000 non-sexist and non-racist books written, printed, and published by and for women, many of which were unavailable at mainstream bookstores or libraries. And this store and other women's bookstores are widely credited with helping grow women's studies as an academic discipline. Woman books frequently hosted free events, including concerts, book signings, a volleyball league, workshops, films, and poetry readings. And in the words of Carla J, woman books became part of the social fabric of the community. Restaurants and cafes provided a direct and more relaxed alternative to mafia owned bars for women who wanted to gather for a meal or a conversation. The women's coffee house in Greenwich Village was open between 1974 and 1978 and predominantly served the lesbian community. Lesbians flocked to the site to meet over coffee and sandwiches and to share ideas. It became a hub for lesbian political activism, hosting meetings of Dykes and Tykes, an organization that advocated for lesbian child custody rights and leading speak outs on issues, including forced sterilization and matriarchy. And this coffee house, like so many other spaces that developed in the 1970s, became a space for women's and lesbians issues 
to be seen and to be heard. I now conclude with these featured words from a brochure on the Women's Liberation Center. These words, including coalition, incubator, and haven are transferable to so many lesbian sites that developed in the 1970s. These were multifaceted sites where women could gather, form connections, explore new ideas, seek support, and frankly, just exist and explore who they were in places where they had autonomy. This autonomy created power and visibility and allowed lesbian activism and community to flourish and to expand. So it is now my distinct pleasure to introduce our two panelists who will continue to highlight the impact of these sites in advancing the lesbian liberation movement. Both of these women were and remain leaders in this movement and helped us to, de to develop this curated theme. So we owe them a big thank you. Ellen Broidy on the left in a Lavender Menace t-shirt is an activist best known as one of the founders of the first large scale gay pride march. She was an early member of the Gay Liberation Front, president of the NYU Student Homophile League, and the founder of Radical Lesbians. She helped organize the Lavender Menace Action in 1970 from her East Village apartment. She moved to California in 1971 to complete a master's in Middle Eastern history at UCLA, and then a doctorate in US women's history at the University of California, Irvine later working at several University of California campuses as a librarian, faculty member, and writing specialist. She resides in Santa Barbara with her partner of 42 years and continues to be active in progressive causes, particularly immigrant justice and women's rights. And then we have Carla J on the right, and she's standing in front of the lavender dinosaur at the ZAP at the American Museum of Natural History. Carla is an activist, scholar, and author who helped pioneer the field of LGBT studies. She was an early member of Red Stockings and the Gay Liberation Front and a co-organizer of the Lavender Menace Action. Jay served as the co-editor of Out of the Closet, Voices of Gay Liberation, a groundbreaking 1972 anthology about the experiences of American gay rights activists. After publishing additional texts, she won a 1996 Lambda Literary Award for Best Lesbian Studies Book and a 2006 Bill Whitehead Lifetime Achievement Award for Lesbian and Gay Writing. She taught English and directed the Women's and Gender Studies programs at Pace University for nearly 40 years. She lives in Manhattan with her wife and continues to champion LGBT rights through her writing. So I will be leading a conversation with Ellen and Carla, which Amanda will be moderating. And if anyone has questions during our conversation, please feel free to add them to the chat and we will try to get to, get to them. And we also plan to have a little time at the end for questions. Well, thank you both so much for agreeing to participate and for your continued help. So we talked about how you both grew up in New York City. How did you first get involved in lesbian activism? You know, I, I wish I clearly knew because I don't think it was called lesbian activism then. I knew about the Daughters of Belitis. I certainly knew about the sea colony. It scared the living daylights out of me. These women seemed, all they all seemed 12 feet tall to me. So I would say that my first real um, venture into this was when I was a student at NYU and the fact that the Oscar Wilde Memorial Bookshop opened up on Mercer Street in the middle of the NYU campus. And that became the first place that I found, I guess, a home or a community. I would say that my involvement in what we're calling now the lesbian movement came somewhat later. I did not come to GLF through Red Stockings or New York Radical Women or even Daughters of Belitis. I came through, I guess, the traditional more gay liberation movement or homophile movement, as we called it at that point, centered around the Oscar Wilde. I was a uh, member of Red Stockings, which was a Marxist feminist group, which developed consciousness raising in this country and also uh, coined the phrase, um, the personal is political, which most people would recognize. Um, the group really 
contained a number of lesbians who were more like um, activist lesbians, I would like to know, but the women in the group who were the major forces in the group were also incredibly homophobic because their Marxist philosophy, which looked at the world through a class analysis, did not, um, could not contain the idea of lesbianism easily. They needed all men to be the enemies and all women to be oppressed. So if some women were oppressing other women through race or uh, through their homophobia, this was really inconvenient for them. And they really couldn't grapple with this. So when the Gay Liberation Front was um, started, I really, you know, I, I ran right over there. I was so, I was so happy to hear about uh, a radical LGBT organization. I wasn't quite sure what it would be, but I was ready to find uh, people who were like myself, hopefully. Yeah, that's amazing. So clearly lesbian activism did not exist in a bubble. And Carla, you're starting to touch on that. So how did other movements intersect with your activism? Just a segue, um, you know, I think that we, you know, we have to recognize um, as LGBTQ people that the Stonewall Uprising and other events were rather late in history and that there was a civil rights movement and a women's movement, and um, I was involved in the peace movement as well, so that we were, a lot of us were involved in these other concerns, and um, we had a lot of friends in these other movements who were often deeply in the closet because we believed in things like the end of the war in Vietnam, but we, did, we couldn't come out in these movements because we very much risk the, um, we risk being thrown out of those groups. And people were indeed thrown out of leftist groups for being homosexual. Um, one of the Except fortunate things for me personally was the fact that I was a student at NYU. So there was a way to integrate all of the kinds of activism I was involved in, the SDS chapter at NYU, the Student Homophile League. So I was not in any of the larger groups outside of the university where I think the homophobia or the anti-lesbian sentiment was a lot stronger. So the integration that, that I saw was with the, the leftist groups on campus and the efforts of the Student Homophile League to join in insofar as we could in, in those, in whatever activities were, were going on heavily around um, anti-war activism. So what was it like being a student in New York City at this time and trying to get involved in activism? Did you face discrimination? Were you entirely out? I'm interested in learning more about that time of your lives. I guess, um, Carla, go on. When I was at Barnard, I, I was really deeply in the closet. Um, when I attended Barnard, and I, I tell this story in my memoir, Tales of the Lavender Menace, during freshman orientation, the very first thing I heard was a story about two women, two young women who were making out in their dorm room, which faced Broadway. And a guy across the street at Columbia looked through the window with binoculars, uh, after which they were expelled from Barnard. And this story was told um, that it was told to us as, as kind of a warning. And the warning was, was heeded. And the other warning was there was a very popular novel, I think it came out in the 64, 65, called The Group by Mary McCarthy. Uh, in which one of the major characters was a lesbian. And there was a, an assembly and they told us at this major uh, event that if you're going to write a book like this, please don't set it at Barnard because Mary McCarthy, I believe had set it at Vassar. And, and they were very, they were, they were just in a tizzy because women's colleges had a reputation for 
having uh, a lot of lesbians and they didn't want to be one of them. But, you know, as a, as a little footnote here, the president of Barnard at that time was a closet lesbian. And, you know, this is, this is also the history of lesbians that lesbians historically did this to other lesbians. Lesbians in the media who worked for places like CBS and NBC, they censored shows that wanted to say something about lesbians. So, you know, it's very complex. I know I had a slightly different experience. I came back to college after some time away. So I was what I guess they referred to as a slightly older student or returning student at that point. And NYU was, as and still is, a much larger entity than Barnard. And I don't think that they were monitoring us in the same way. It was much more of a commuter college. It was in Greenwich Village, so it was impacted by what was going on in the environment in, in the village itself. So I never felt particularly closeted at school, which is not to say I wasn't closeted within the context of my family, but the fact that NYU is where I landed in my second effort to go to college was extremely fortunate for me, even in 1967, 68, when I finally ended up there. I think like many lesbians of my era, I lived a compartmentalized life. Um, I had a boyfriend. I, I found one, fortunately, far away at Yale, uh, you know, so we didn't see each other very often. And, um, you know, on, on most weekends, because he was far away, I went down to Cookies, you know, and I mean, when Cookies opened about 67 in New York, I mean, people who are younger than Ellen and I should note that the legal age for drinking was 18 years old. And uh, so there were there were bars and places and I could I would go to the village and walk around and it was quite frightening to just look into to bars and not really know where to go and to know which places might be safe. And um, it was a lot of trial and error to, to find a place and, and to find a place where the, the people seemed okay. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't really easy if you didn't know people um, to, to go out with. Location, 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 location. location. I lived in the village. I lived in the East Village. So it was a lot easier for me to just, it, between walking from my apartment to school, to just encounter all manner of people that you would not necessarily find on 116th Street. So we've touched upon this a bit in some of our discussions over the past year, but how did both of you feel going to lesbian bars or mixed bars while you were in college? I don't drink, I don't smoke, I'm a terrible pool player, and I don't have much rhythm. So my uh, joy in being in bars was quite limited. In fact, I only really started going to bars, into bars, to do some kind of political action, like getting kicked out of cookies because we were advertising a women's dance. So bars were not, I was in them, I knew where they were, but they weren't central to my existence because they didn't have, even though there were lots of women in them, they didn't have much to offer me. I, I, I think, you know, Ellen, uh, Ellen uh, made up for it. She was, she was so very cute when I met her. I'm sure she never had to go to a bar to meet someone. <laughs> um, I, um, I went to a number of bars. I mean, I, I, I remember going into a place called the, something like the Stone Pony, and I, I walked in the Sea Colony and Cookies, and I didn't like them. You know, you went into these bars, and um, the first question you'd be asked, I looked kind of like a hippie. Um, I had long hair um, and dressed a bit like a hippie, but I didn't look like a femme. And people would ask me whether I was butcher fam, and I didn't know how to answer that. So I would say, well, you know, I'm kind of butch on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and I'm fam on Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday, and they'd run away. 
Um, or they'd ask me my sign and then they'd run away. <laughs> it was just kind of, I never seemed to have um, a really good, a really good answer. And Cookie herself was really terrifying. She was uh, mm -hmm. probably a front for, you know, the mob. And she had this uh, kind of blonde hair that was teased into a blonde beehive hairdo and she had sp sprayed it into place in the mid 1950s and there it was. And if you didn't um, order a drink uh, promptly and keep drinking, she would take her cigarette out of her mouth and stick it under your chin and order another drink for you for which you would pay. So uh, I didn't care for the bars. There were women who liked them. They had a social group there. I met people there and they liked that. Um, they were very smoky. The back doors were chain shot. I was afraid I was going to die in a place like that or be arrested. Um, it depended on kind of weighing the, what you got out of it as opposed to the negativity. And for some people it was a positive experience. And for me, it just really, it really didn't work out well. I really wasn't meeting people I uh, was happy with. It was also kind of um, dark and dingy. They're, they weren't exactly pleasant places to be in. And I must say about Cookie's hair, Cookie's hair makes Dolly Parton look like she had a marine buzz cut. So, you know, Cookie, Cookie, had, Cookie had great hair, great hair. And Carla's right, it, it was plastered into place in about 1956, didn't move. It seems that the lesbian bars were not your ideal spaces. So in what spaces did you find home and where did you have these positive experiences? And these can be sites I mentioned or entirely different ones. Well, a lot of the socializing did go on in, in people's apartments. There were a couple of buildings where two or three different lesbian lesbians or lesbian households live. Um, our building is 338 East 6th Street was one of them. There was an apartment building on, I believe, Perry Street where two or three women lived. So that was one place, pe people's homes. And then as I had mentioned earlier, um, the bookstore, the Oscar, the Oscar Wilde, uh, wasn't a very large space, but it was, it was a central space for people. This was not, this was before it moved over to Christopher Street. This is still on Mercer Street. In a lot of places, there was the first student homophile group in the United States was at Columbia, but the the I only went there twice, and the two times I went there, no women other women aside from myself were present. I know that Martha Shelley was a member, but she just wasn't there when I went. You met people and they invited you to parties. I had a girlfriend um, who went to CCNY. I really didn't want a girlfriend who went to Barnard. That would have been maybe a little too risky. Um, people in the summer, people went to Reese Park to Bay One, yes. was a place where people went that was a, a, a gay, uh, it was called the Gay Bay, and uh, there were, it was mostly men, there were quite a few women there. Um, I never had the resources to go to Cherry Grove or Fire Island. In fact, I've never been to Fire Island. I mean, I'm, I may be the only living lesbian in New York who has never been, I've never been to Fire Island. I just was, I was extremely poor. Um, I was supporting myself primarily in college, and very few young women of my generation were doing that. I had a scholarship and um, I was more or less on my own for reasons too long to go into. Um, the only thing about Bay One was I had a bisexual aunt who lived not far from there and she would go up and down the beach because the, some of the people were naked and she liked to look. And I didn't really know that she was bisexual back then and I was a little, you know, she would see me and, and, and talk. She knew I was a lesbian, but neither of us could say anything. It was just, it was the way it was. You know, I found out later uh, that she had had an affair uh, in her youth with her manager. She was a jazz singer. And uh, so she would come and look and I would see her coming and neither of us 
for our whole lives never talked about it. It's kind of sad, it really is. Well, I had, a, as you mentioned, uh, Fire Island. I was a student, had a student job, but my partner at the time actually had a real job. And we had about a 1 16th share in a house in Fire Island Pines, along with Barbara Giddings and Kayla Husen, who were mentioned in, in, the, in Amanda's introduction. And that's where we were the night of Stonewall, the first night of Stonewall. So my, my connection to Stonewall was in this house with seven or eight other lesbians um, in the Pines, which was also heavily male, but not quite as male as Cherry Grove. Yeah, so Ellen, you mentioned earlier on that your location in the East Village made it easier to meet people. So I'm wondering what factors of New York City really facilitated your ability to advance lesbian activism? Whoa, just again, location, location, location. The, the village was, it was a village. It was a place apart in many ways from the rest of the city. Artsier, more liberal in quotes, or, or more progressive. And just walking in, as I said, walking from the apartment to class, you would see a whole range of people behaving normally to, to my lights. And that's what made it, allowed me to feel more comfortable in who I was and also where I was. Um, it's one of the parts of the city where I never, no matter what time of day or night it was, that I actually felt any kind of fear being being out in the streets. Um, so it played it was a, it was it played a significant role in how I came to embrace New York as an important site to do this work, which I didn't know was work at that point. It was just my life. I want to mention the, the biggest site of lesbianism in the village in the late 60s was the Women's House of Detention, which was on Greenwich Avenue between 6th Avenue and 10th Street. And um, it, was a, a, it was a prison of, I think, 18 stories. You, Ryan, is writing a book about it right now. I think it will be a fabulous book. And... Um, very often on weekends, the women in the house of detention were calling out the windows to their lovers who were on the street. Um, and people were calling back and forth, up and down from the windows to the street. Um, and it was, it was very sad. And it was also to lesbians, a little bit of a warning, you know, that if you weren't careful, you could be one day out on the street and then you could be in the house of detention. And I can give you some examples of this. Valerie Solanus, who shot Andy Warhol, sold her scum manifesto on the corner of the women's house of detention. And she had a little card table usually, and she would sit out there. She was usually on the corner by Sixth Avenue uh, by the little triangle there. And I would go by and I would talk to her and she was selling that thing for between a quarter and a dollar. And, you know, and then she shot Andy Warhol and she was inside there. Um, other people who were in there, uh, Grace Paley was inside the Women's House of Detention. Um, uh, Andrea Dworkin was inside there and uh, several members of the Black Panthers were in there. Um, and particularly for women of color, it was really, um, it, it was really, uh, you know, a terrible place to be. Now it was torn down, of course, um, in the mid, by the mid seventies, it had been torn down, uh, which uh, was probably good for property development in the village. But of course, the women who were moved out to Rikers Island, it made it so much harder for their friends and relatives to visit them. It was, it was a real monstrosity, the place, but it also was well located. Well, and we also, 
we frequently had demonstrations there. There would be the women shouting back and forth to their partners who were incarcerated and the rest of us screaming, House of D, tear it down. And that, that happened over a consistent period of time on, on, a, on weekend afternoons. Yeah, and I just want to take a detour and note that I see that Eleanor Batchelder is on the call and she was involved with the founding of Woman Books. Um, so it's very exciting to see her here as well and thank you for your contributions. Um, okay, so switching gears a bit, I know both of you were at the Lavender Menace action. What was the spirit like in that room? What were you feeling in that moment? Elated. I think that, do, can I give a brief capsule history of sort of that morning? Because it sounded yeah. like from something somebody said that we all came in, you know, 17 lesbians in our Lavender Menace t-shirts. No, we came in in quote unquote disguise. We had other outer clothing on top of the t-shirts. Michaela Griffo actually was running the light board for the entire auditorium. She flipped the lights off, the whole place went dark. She flipped them back on and there we were lining the auditorium. Some of us alongside on either side, some in the audience, and we had taken our outer garments off and became the lavender menace when the lights came back on. It was actually, I thought, thrilling. I found it a thrilling moment. Jesse Falstein was also back there backstage, um, pulling the plug on, on the feminists, the straight feminists. I, I was planted in the audience, um, which is why I was standing up and yelling that I was tired of being in the closet in the movement. And I pulled off my blouse and, and uh, said, you know, I'm tired of being you know, in the closet, I pulled my blouse off and joined, joined the group. But uh, one of the things, of course, is aside from um, wanting to have the women's movement recognize lesbians and include um, issues of lesbianism, we also were interested in their including issues of race, class, um, and other issues because these things were not on the agenda at all. And it was really quite appalling. And they did include these things. And uh, that's how um, the women's movement really became more intersectional um, back then. They were really, they were really quite narrow-minded. And um, it, it was really quite off-putting. And then we're talking, of course, about women's liberation. Remember, there, there were two branches. There was women's liberation and radical feminism. And, and this was women's liberation, which just wanted uh, a bigger piece of the corporate pie. The radical feminists like Red Stockings, New York Radical Feminists, and WITCH, which was inter women's international terrorist conspiracy from hell, wanted to throw the pie out and make a new one. So, um, you know, there really were many different um, groups involved, but uh, they really were very white and middle class and, and needed to be pushed towards being more intersectional. It did require a real action in a, in a gentle and I think very sisterly way we kidnapped that conference and didn't let go of it until it wasn't necessarily demands, but it was issues could be put on the table and honestly discussed. Both of you have mentioned race and class, and I want to ask what tensions existed within the lesbians liberation movement? Would you call the movement cohesive or would you say there were a lot of internal divisions? Um, I think, you know, one of the things that, you know, we have to recognize uh, about various states of being, and I recognize this as being LGBT, because, uh, you know, I, I identify as a non-binary lesbian now, and um, I, and also I'm, I'm, leg I'm legally blind. So one of the things that's interesting about these two states of being is that 
I don't necessarily have a lot in common with other people who share uh, these states of being. You know, if I go to a group of blind people, they, they're not necessarily like me just because they also lost their eyesight. And the same thing is true with being a lesbian. Uh, one of the interesting things about the Gay Liberation Front and also radical lesbians is we pull together because heterosexual and heterosexist society saw us all as the same. You know, whether we were uh, gay, trans, bi, into s and um, had been in a couple forever or slept with 300 people a week, they saw us all as exactly the same. And we knew that they were going to treat us the same way, but we were a very diverse group. And for most of us who were very young, it was really quite eye-opening to be in such a diverse group with people we hadn't you know, ever encountered or interacted with before. But I think as radicals, we generally um, handled differences better than many other types of people might. We, we really tried uh, to it, to come to consensus was was a way of you know trying to enact business back then. Of course, there were differences and there were many fights and we were often quite dysfunctional. But I think it was really remarkable, generally overall, how well people got on despite all kinds of social, racial, class differences. But I think also the the, the most significant differences at least in, in my recollection of both the Gay Liberation Front and radical lesbians were class differences. It was, an, I think, a largely white group, but it did cut across many lines of class. And I think there were some underlying tensions around, around the class differences. And I don't know if those have been addressed you know, to this day, but as, Carla said we did we did sort of aim for intersectionality for diversity to understand the other people's struggles as well as our own and clearly that's something we should all aim for in our activism today as well which leads me to a closing question before we take some audience questions you both still are activists and are still doing amazing work what do you hope to see in terms of progress for lesbians and the LGBTQ movement and women in the future? What are some of your top priorities? Well, I, this, is, this is not going to sound terribly optimistic because I'm not feeling terribly optimistic here in, in 2021, is that I think we have a struggle not to lose ground at, at the moment. I think we're in a very precarious point in the culture wars, which is all the, which is everything that, that circles around politics in this country at this moment. And I'm, you know, no matter what I think about the military or marriage or, you know, in these institutions, I don't want us to lose ground. And I fear that we might. So it's not, you know, I'm, I don't have uh, you know, so great ideas about what I'd like to see in the future, but I do not want to go backwards. Yeah, I, I, I think we, um, you know, I, I think that we need more to be involved in, um, we need to go back more to this intersectionality. Um, I remember just as an example, that I was involved in the women's movement when choice in this country was not legal. And one of the things that has most affected me in my life uh, was the experiences of two close friends in college who lost uh, because of different choices. One was locked up in her room by her parents because she was pregnant. Um, at the end of which time she gave birth to a dead child. Um, my other uh, friend was my roommate who went to Puerto Rico and came back and bled on her bed 
for several weeks until she finally made up her mind to go to a hospital. Um, even though the, the abortion in Puerto Rico was legal. I went to the march um, the other weekend down at Foley Square and I wish, you know, that, that more of my, you know, that my, more of my gay brothers had been there. I feel very strongly, um, I am very for um, trans rights. And, but I feel this is the same struggle to control our bodies. But that means also, I think we all have to get out there for each other in order for us to hold on to our rights and to get medical treatment in this country. And, you know, I'm still trying to get out there. And, you know, I say, well, I don't know where I'm going, but I still get out there and walk. And, and I think, you know, if, if I can do that, um, you know, it must be that other people can do that too. You know, and you know, and I can see it. You know, I'm gonna soon be on a rollator out there. You know, one day. Now I'm out there with the guide dog. So, you know, I don't know what's next. But um, the only thing that can stop you is if you let, if you let the patriarchy stop you. And if they stop you, then they've won. And I wasn't ready for the patriarchy to win in the 1960s. I'm not ready for them to win now. You know, so if they study the stubborn gene, they can start with me. That's all I have to say. I want to thank both of you so much for agreeing to participate in this panel. And I know your activism means a lot to me personally. About a year ago, I think one of the first questions I asked so excitedly to Ellen was, do you have any tips for a young activist? So Carla, if you ever need someone out there joining the fight, I'm happy to join you as well. So I wanna open it up to audience questions. Amanda, you can chime in. I think the easiest way would probably be to type them in the chat and then one of us can read them. Yeah, yeah, if anyone in the audience has questions for Carla or Ellen or Emily, uh, please write it in the chat. Um, we did have one to kickstart it. Um, and I guess this would be for Ellen and Carla, but Emily uh, chimed in as well. Do you see a connection to history and historic sites as important to inspire young people today to continue the tradition of activism? That connection to understanding that this history is all around them when they may previously not have known about it? I mean, I can chime in here first. I mean, absolutely, I'm a historic preservationist. And when I think about what inspires my own day-to-day -day life and the choices I make, it often connects to memories and experience I had at various places that were important to me. And as a kid, I was so inspired to learn about female activists at all of these amazing sites. And when I came to Columbia, one of the reasons I chose Columbia was because I saw the connection to the NYC LGBT Historic Sites Project. And I feel that people are so responsive to place-based conversation because everyone can connect to a place. Everyone has a place that really sparks a memory for them. And if you can evoke that on a larger scale, it can be very powerful. It's also very powerful to go back and visit some of these places when you can. When I stand in front of the Women's Liberation Center in Chelsea, I can definitely feel the spirit of the building and the activism. And I like to think that can be transferred to others as well. Yes, uh, you know, this is a point for me to say that uh, I am so proud of the work that the NYC LGBTQ Historic Sites group is doing. This is such valuable work. And I remember when I was living in Paris in um, the very late 1970s, and I would walk around Paris and I would see plaques to Gertrude Stein and um, Colette. And these were my people, or so I thought. And, um, you know, people need this. Um, for years, I took my students at pace on walking tours of the village. And it might have been the one thing I think that really stuck with them for, for years and years, that, that rather than just learning about history, they walk through it. You know, I took them to the sites of the bookstores and uh, the centers and things like that. And it really was, um, it really was very, 
uh, when history comes to life like this, it's very important for people to see it and feel it. And we live in such a tear down culture that, you know, anything new is good, anything old, well, let's, you know, rip it down, let's replace it, let's renovate it. And the fact that you've gotten, you know, historical site recognition for these places is just, is fantastic because our history lives in that brick and stone. How might you have felt this sort of follow-up growing up if you saw sites like that being celebrated? I know it was a different time, but as young people today, and maybe something you may have been affected by if, if these sites were just being celebrated for what they are and for their significance. Oh, in incredible. So this, ha this has value. So the people who were involved in these sites, they must have value. Hey, I must have value too. Yeah, I, I think that these are meaningful for people. I mean, we did know of a few sites. Um, I remember standing outside the home of Juna Barnes, who was still alive in Patchen Place. And I remember that Bertha Harris, who was a wonderful novelist, would go in there once in a while and leave her a flower and sometimes a note, but she never responded. Um, she died and, you know, I think she was 99 years old in the late 90s. Um, but, you know, it would have been so wonderful for some of these people to come out and acknowledge these young lesbians, but just to have these sites, we kind of knew about a few people who might have been lesbians, uh, Willa Cather, for example, uh, people like that. Um, I knew a little that Eleanor Roosevelt had been around the village, um, but it really is, um, we all need a tradition. We all have like, a re you know, people often have a religious tradition, an ethnic tradition. Uh, this is the, the culture and history of our people, you know, and we can't just have the Stonewall Inn as our epic of Gilgamesh, you know, we need an entire, we need a landscape, not just one, one bar that's been recreated. Right, context. Yeah. Oh, and we actually have a number of questions that have come in. Um, the first here is, in the 1970s, how did lesbians view transgender rights and how has that perception changed in the 21st century? Well, it's, de it's definitely changed because trans people have taken the movement on themselves. They are, they are standing up in a unique and powerful way for their rights that I think that um, wasn't how I experienced even the people in street transvestites. I mean, they were called transvestites then. They had kind of a, had medical terminology applied to them in the same way that, that we did. But I think, I think it's quite different now. And I think it's quite different because of the people whose experience it is taking ownership of that experience and the necessity of being political and powerful around it. I think, you know, um, I don't think that a universal label could be applied in the past or could be applied today. Uh, I certainly think that there were individuals within, for example, the Gay Liberation Front who um, liked the, the members of STAR and there were people who disliked the members of STAR or people who liked individual members of STAR and, and disliked other people. I mean, after all, um, the star members weren't uniform in any way. They were quite different from, from one another. Um, and today, I think there are a lot of different opinions. I think what, for me, it's almost tragic that with the right wing being at our throats, we don't really need them because we're very busy right now eating each other. Um, but we can't, I, you know, it, it's sort of like the vaccine. You can't really tell other people how, what to believe about this. And um, it, there's, there doesn't seem to be an open door for dialogue on this issue. 
and it makes me really sad, but I didn't come into this movement to fight with other people who are like us, LGBTQ, even if they're not much like me. They're not my enemy, other LGBTQ people. They're not. And that's not why I'm in this. And um, I think it's misguided, but nobody's asking me. <laughs> no one, the people who are, who are in full attack mode. Another question. My students were talking about the value of lesbian spaces last week. They were torn about the importance of women only organizing. So either cisgender women or women identified cis and trans women together. What are your thoughts on the usefulness of women's only spaces today? I suspect that there's still a place for women only spaces. Um, the, the experience is just different and we still live in an enormously sexist society where women are second class citizens. And it's nice to be in a space where you don't have to constantly feel that, even though that may be the conversation that's going on. Mm -hmm. So I, I, see, I see value. I still see value to it, just so long as it's not in the bar. Now, I also see value in women's only spaces as well. This is something that I crave in New York City and don't find often. Um, and I really desire inclusive women's spaces that are welcoming to trans and non-binary individuals. I went to college and one of my favorite things was the women's weightlifting hour at the gym. And it felt like such a safe space to explore and to learn and to grow. And that's not something I've found since moving to New York two, three years ago. Yeah, I, I, I think, you know, um, we, we do have to be careful though um, not to equate um, gender, though, with 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 actual experience, because as an elder um, and who goes to some senior groups, these groups are many of them are almost exclusively women. Uh, they're cisgendered women, right? But they're not particularly liberated. These these women, you know, so uh, some of them. So it, it's, it's for me, it's kind of it's it depends. You know, your experience of space depends who's in a space. And and, and you know, um, I understand that that people want things and they think, oh, well, you know, our experience has been different uh, from, from that of trans women. But then when I'm actually, when I've actually attended some of these spaces, for example, the OLOC, the old lesbians organizing for change gathering, it was a, it was a great weekend, but there was nothing that was discussed that, um, someone who had transitioned would not relate to. You know, I mean, nobody there, I suspect, for example, was still even menstruating. It was kind of, you know, I'm thinking, what are we talking about here? Uh, that there is some biological thing that, you know, I, I know they're talking about, about their experiences maybe being raised, but no one was really talking about that either. So we really have to, I think maybe, maybe sometimes we need to do a reality check of what is really um, inclusive, you know? Because, um, you know, I look at this sometimes as a person who is also Jewish. And I remember, I remember when Jews were excluded from various places, from golf clubs and, and hotels and various places. And people who are Christians just said, well, you know, we want to be with people like us. There's nothing really harmful about that. Well, it's harmful to the people who are excluded, you know, and it's always harmful to the people who are not allowed entry, even if it's one person. And, and I identify with the people who are cut out. And, and that's my point of view. And I know it's not everyone's. Uh, I thought, so I think we'll wrap with um, Saskia Sheffer from Lesbian History Archives, kind of perfect because it's one of our sites and we're in communication with her often to um, use uh, great photos from their archives. So Saskia has uh, asked 
would like to speak uh, in, instead of typing the question. So, Sophia? I, I apologize that I don't have video. It takes away from my ability to hear the audio. So I'm just a, a voice at the moment. I am one of the, the women at the Lesbian Her Story Archives. I've been there for 30 years and I cannot tell you how shocked I was a week ago when my 26 year old intern told me she was she was so grateful for the safe space that the archives was. And we talk about this all the time now. And mm -hmm. it is about the word lesbian. It is about the, um, mm -hmm. the difficulty in which the various groups that claim identity, that claim to be women, that claim to be this, that, or the other thing, in, it, is, it, is, it is almost, there's a fair amount of aggression involved. The younger women feel really, really pressured to accept any definition of what a woman is, but not mm -hmm. their own. Their own is mm -hmm. not allowed. I cannot tell you how often I get comments on Instagram when I post anything that has to do with either radical lesbians from the 70s, which are immediately called TERFs, even though that wasn't even a concept at that time. Mm -hmm. Or it is, it is, I am being told, you are not allowed to put up a picture of vulva art because it is discriminatory to those people, to those women who don't have one. And it is, I don't know how to approach this. And I, and, and I wonder if you have any any feelings about that, any context for that. I find this the most difficult conversation of my time. There mm -hmm. it is. And if anyone that's, has ideas, feel free to share in the chat too. That, that's, that seems to be, to be a, almost a whole different symposium Mm. On, on that question. It's extraordinarily complicated. And I move back and forth personally between feeling the need and the desire to be as inclusive as possible. And on the other side of that, feeling a kind of erasure of lesbian experience, which I find, you know, at 75 years old, I don't want to be hurt by that but I am. I don't want my history to be erased. And a large part of my history is defining myself. I used to call myself a prenatal lesbian. I mean, I've been a lesbian for you know, as, guess as long as I've been. And I do sense that there is some, some erasure of that. And it pains me, but I don't want to address that erasure by erasing somebody else's experience in life. So I'm in a, I'm in a little bit of a bind here, um, but it would be great to have this conversation in a much more involved and evolved um, setting. I, I share Ellen's um, concern and um, one of the things I think the Sites Project is doing is to combat Erasure. I mean, and that is one of the things that that we as as lesbian lesbians have to combat because it really it really is happening. And um, at least this way, uh, people know that we were there, and that's really that's really important. Um, you know, not what you're talking about is a different kind of battleground. Of the body, and it's really it's really sad that 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 this is happening. Okay, I think with that, I uh, just want to wrap up, and I want to thank Emily, Ellen, and Carla for joining us tonight, for sharing their knowledge, and for the conversation. For everyone who joined us, um, October is LGBT History Month, so uh, I hope you join us for our other programs. And um, check out our website, follow us on social media, 
And um, we hope to have uh, a great rest of your evening. So thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you.